But now we are trying to get a common consensus, like towards a common definition of global heart. And some of you guys have already contributed aspects of this. But it's, actually, it's just a study and research. You guys talk about data, how to use that, and then research into why is Brazil doing better than other neighboring countries? Why is Mauritius doing better? And then also, so it's a study, research, and practice that places emphasis on what was said earlier by Christian, improving health, achieving equity in health for all. So that is global health, and that should be your definition. So either you are for profit or non-profit, these are the attributes that we want to see you bringing to all. That, and it could be a minimum, but you could set a minimum standard or minimum deliverables that everybody should have. I think it's okay if uh, someone wants more, uh, should be able to get that. But at least on that sort of level, we should have that. But let us go back and look at our history, how we took this into consideration. Um, so this is the pre-Middle Ages. And I mean, it's a, I just didn't want to uh, puncture your optimism or your ego. But we are not the first people thinking about global health. It really started way before us, if that is okay with you. Uh, so they were actually preoccupied uh, with, there were ancient civilizations like in Egypt, in Ethiopia, and others in China that really had sophisticated engineering capacity. The way they built their, they, they planned their cities or towns, they actually took into consideration hygiene, uh, uh, sewage disposal, and really were very methodic, they, how they grouped houses. So that is not new. It's been in pre-ages. That was the uh, uh, time also that they started to think about disease causality. They started seeing that, oh, if we do that, it leads to that. If we change the way we live, that. Unfortunately, that knowledge of global health and well-being just was deposited in these civilizations and only. It didn't cross boundary. So that was really the isolationist view. And we move quickly to Middle Ages. And this is, this is a period where people became well alert that, oh, it wasn't, it's not enough for us to protect ourselves. We probably have to share with others in order to protect us. And that came through well, the uh, 14th century plague and the fact that the, in, in Italy especially, they had a way of letting other countries or other townships know that there is a disease and they use the sailors. And there was even uh, situations where if a ship is coming to dock and they suspect that there's somebody on that ship with uh, the, the uh, plague, the ship will not be allowed to come on shore. You stay on the high seas for 40 days. And my understanding is that the word, the word quarantine is an Italian word for 40 days. So that is where we got it from. And then they developed these public health offices and dispatches, dispatching people that, oh no, don't come to Venice, uh, dog here and that. So there was some sort of concept developing during that time. And we come to the European imperialization uh, way when the Europeans started to conquer the rest of the world. And uh, probably that is what brought into mind what we now term health disparity. Uh, that con uh, the, the, the conquerors found that, that, you know what, there is difference between what we, the invaders, and the invadees. And some of them were not surviving in the harsh conditions of this rainforest. People dying due to malaria or yellow fever. So there was that consciousness to how can we improve? And some of it started, so they started to think about the colonies, the countries that we are conquering, that if we probably improve the health of that uh, country, we may be able to conquer them. We may be able to take their goods. So these have all been started in a very long time. And I think 
the very perfect uh, global health scenario emerged during the Industrial Revolution, where they really came to terms that heart is not a dom the, the uh, domain for only health uh, practitioners, doctors or nurses. It's all of, for all of us, all for health. That was a, how the concept developed, that the uh, economic people were needed, uh, lawyers were needed, and it became a multidisciplinary approach uh, to do that. And a gentleman that is credited for in the, in the 1840s is uh, Chadwick, who was a politician in the UK and brought up the Public Health Act to really, uh, they talk about construction of uh, buildings, sewage disposal, uh, treatment of diseases, and what have you. And then also an important thing that happened there was people really uh, followed up their observations. If, they, if you see something, say something. It's not new. It started there. This John Snow, who actually made an important epidemiologic um, uh, discovery when there was a corolla outbreak in London, and really was able to associate that, oh, on the Thames, there are different parts of the river, or people living around the river, or getting their source from the different portions or zones of the river were disproportionately affected by the cholera. And that really brought them to know that which station uh, the problem was. And that's, that became important as one of the uh, I mean, uh, foundations for public health. And so this has been going on uh, uh, for a very long time. The last one that really uh, I think did a lot of good for us was after uh, World War II, that we all decided that no, we will not do this to ourselves anymore. Let us now think of us as a globe and have organizations or institutions that would police our heart so that no one country can take advantage of the other. That is the birth of the uh, World Health Organization, the United Nations agencies for food uh, and what have you, children, uh, security. So that, those were all concepts that were developed. And some non-governmental organizations came in. In the US actually had the most of this in terms of development because individuals, very rich people, Rockefeller Foundation, individuals who had money started to really move towards uh, some health program. And that brings us to where we are. Uh, what I call the contemporary global heart. And this started in the 1990s, uh, when we started seeing um, probably around 81, the introduction of HIV into our population. And then we started to realize that, oh, we are all at risk. And then the one thing that also helped in the 90s, we went back to the Industrial Revolution that, oh, we've done this before in our history. It's supposed to be interdisciplinary. It's supposed to be multidisciplinary. And so the, in 1993, the, so the, the World Bank each year comes out with this uh, report called the World Development Report. In 1993, they devoted the whole report on health, how to invest in health. And that was the game changer. That is when, like some of you have already said, that it pays off to invest in health. And they were not only looking at health, like uh, sometimes when you talk about health, people really will think about, oh, having hypertension or diabetes or having pneumonia. No, they were also thinking about investing in the determinants of health, things that could bring on ill health. Like education has correlation with income and also health. The more, the, the more you are educated or the number of years you spend in school, the more likely that you would be able to even appreciate what health is, right? And be able to uh, help. So that was the, the impetus. Can we invest in health to make a change? 